So I'm going to talk uh, about my own story. We were talking earlier about um, you know, the usefulness of storytelling and narrative in communicating uh, science and communicating specifically uh, issues related to climate change. And as many of you probably know, I've had a somewhat unique uh, experience on the front lines of the debate over climate change. And many of you know my story, um, at least uh, the sort of the broad strokes of it. Uh, but um, I think there are a, a few uh, interesting experiences that you may not be familiar with that I'll be talking uh, about. Um, this is loosely uh, based on my uh, recent book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, but uh, with uh, a few updates to the present. So the first point uh, that I'll make here is, um, in, it's one that I often, uh, with uh, in my public lectures, uh, I'll spend about five minutes going over the basic science of climate change. And the point that I try to communicate is that this isn't controversial science. This is nearly two century old physics and chemistry, irrefutable measurements of how we're changing the composition of the atmosphere, and the fact that as we expect, the globe is indeed uh, warming up. Uh, the science isn't controversial, and yet there is this uh, huge uh, debate, and we've already talked about the disconnect between where the science is and where our public discourse is on this issue. And the gorilla in the room, of course, is the fact that there has been a disinformation campaign. There was some discussion about this earlier. Um, you know, what's the role of the industry-funded disinformation campaign? In fact, I think it was John Cook who mentioned the Frank uh, Luntz memo. Uh, back, uh, it was uh, a memo uh, from his Republican pollster, Frank Luntz, who was um, advising his clients, essentially the fossil fuel industry. Uh, back in 2002 is when the memo was leaked. And what it basically said was that there was a closing window of opportunity, um, that the public was becoming convinced that there was a scientific consensus surrounding the issue of human-caused climate change, and were they to become convinced that there was a consensus, they would demand policy action. But there was still a window of opportunity to insert doubt, uh, manufacture controversy, convince the public that there was no scientific consensus. Um, and that is part of a much larger um, campaign that has been funded by special interest industry, uh, funded special interests to sort of poison the discourse, the public discourse over climate change. It's not actually all that new uh, an approach. Um, this is what the tobacco industry did decades ago. And uh, Naomi Oreskes, for example, in her book, Merchants of Doubt, talks about how the modern movement to deny Climate change has its roots in previous campaigns, like the uh, campaign to discredit the science of tobacco uh, impacts on human health. In fact, as many of you probably know, some of the same scientific advocates who worked for the tobacco industry are today working for the fossil fuel industry, denying climate change. And so we have powerful legislators like the senior senator of the hottest state, as of two summers ago, uh, Oklahoma became the hottest state ever, um, and that summer, James Inhofe was continuing uh, to proclaim that climate change is the single greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Um, well, interestingly, that same summer, he was slated to give the keynote lecture at the Heartland Institute Climate Change Denial Conference in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, he had to uh, cancel out at the last minute. Uh, it turns out he had gotten ill swimming in a lake back in Oklahoma that was suffering from an algal bloom that was a result of the unprecedented heat and drought that they were experiencing. Um, he even quipped that Mother Nature getting back at me. Uh, the, the irony wasn't lost on him. So, and many of you know how I have found myself at the center of this debate. Uh, nearly 15 years ago now, uh, my co-authors and I published this curve, this estimate of how temperatures had changed over the past thousand years, um, showing that the recent warming appears to be unprecedented as far back as we can go. And as Max alluded to, it was sort of a metaphor. Uh, this became an icon in the climate change debate because it told a simple story. You didn't need to understand the physics of how a climate model works to understand what this curve was telling you, that there is something uh, unprecedented taking place in our climate today, and by inference, it probably has something to do with what we're doing. Um, it got a name, the hockey stick. It became sort of a central object um, in the climate change debate. And as happens to icons or objects in the climate change debate, they get attacked. Um, and so uh, there has been an effort now for more than, more than 15 years to discredit this graphic. And ironically, 
It's ironic on several levels. First of all, the hockey stick is not one of the central lines of evidence for human-caused climate change. It wouldn't matter if there was no hockey stick or any hockey league. There are now dozens of these sorts of reconstructions, and they all come to the same basic conclusion. The recent warming does appear to be unprecedented as far back as we can go. But even if we didn't have that uh, evidence, we would still know that humans are warming the planet, changing the climate, and that it represents a threat if we don't do something about it. Now, the latest episode, um, just uh, a few weeks ago, um, the largest compilation of global temperature records to date uh, was published. Uh, 78 scientists from 60 institutions from 24 different countries coming up with a new estimate of how uh, the global temperature had changed in past centuries. And really in a bombshell um, uh, finding, they overturned, oh no, actually, they came up with the same result that, oops, that we did. Uh, oops, went past it, um, that we did about 15 years ago. Um, and in fact, more re uh, a few weeks earlier, or about a month earlier than that, there was another reconstruction that was published. Lower resolution, there's some caveats and uncertainties in terms of the time scales that can be resolved. But basically, finding that the recent warming spike appears to be unprecedented, uh, literally during the time of modern uh, human civilization. And if you plot the projected warming under business as usual emissions over the next century on this scale, uh, that's what you get. Um, so it drives home that we are indeed engaged in an unprecedented experiment with the atmosphere and with the climate. But hockey stick continues to be attacked. This one 15-year-old curve, which is essentially irrelevant given now, given everything else that's been done, continues to be attacked because it has become this icon um, in the climate change debate. It has become an object that climate change deniers feel they need to take down. Um, and so back in uh, summer 2005, I got a letter from, uh, well, actually, it was a subpoena uh, from Joe Barton, uh, the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And, you know, I'm sure it was a coincidence. It, it happens that he was the largest recipient of fossil fuel money in the entire U.S. House of Representatives. Um, and he uh, read a criticism of our work in that, uh, you know, as all we know, that very respectable scientific journal, the uh, editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. And based on that, wanted to engage in an open-ended fishing expedition, uh, to demand all of my uh, emails with um, 39 different climate scientists, several of the individuals in this room would be among them, um, in an effort, uh, pretty transparent effort, to try to find something to, to uh, embarrass or uh, um, discredit us and by uh, extension our work. Um, this was before Barton had actually become a household uh, name uh, with his uh, infamous apology to BP that some of you may remember back in 2010. But nonetheless, um, his attack against us got quite a bit of attention uh, from the scientific community, AAAS, AGU, uh, Nature, all you know, called out what they saw as a transparent effort to intimidate scientists whose findings might be inconvenient to the special interests that fund his campaign. Uh, whilst uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post wrote at, uh, biting editorials uh, condemning you know, uh, what uh, they called a witch hunt in the case of the Washington Post. Even his home state, Houston Chronicle, you might, thought, you might have thought would have been a little more sympathetic to his um, views, um, called him out, uh, as did Henry Waxman. Now, that might not be too surprising uh, to those of you who know Henry Waxman, a Democrat from California, a progressive Democrat, played a very important role in trying to bring the tobacco industry to justice for their disinformation campaign decades ago. He came out and... Uh, and supported us and, uh, and, and blasted um, Joe Barton. Um, but what you might be surprised to learn is that the greatest hero in this, partic in this, this uh, particular story turned out to be a Republican. It was Sherwood Bullard, uh, the chair of the House Science Committee at the time. He was an old school pro-science, pro-environment uh, Republican, and he actually called Barton out in harsher terms than any of the Democrats. Um, and that was very important because it it sent a message that this was not a partisan uh, issue um, and that we should not be politicizing science in this way and engaging in efforts to discredit scientists simply because of a political agenda. And uh, John McCain came out and, and supported us as well. In fact, I'll read a couple of his quotes. The message sent by the Congressional Committee to the three scientists was not subtle, published politically unpalatable scientific results. Embrace yourself for political retribution, which might include denial of the opportunity to compete for federal funds 
It represents a kind of intimidation which threatens the relationship between science and public policy. That behavior must not be tolerated. It's almost unprecedented in modern politics to see one Republican call out another Republican in that way. Well, the attacks did stop. Hey, I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> the attacks didn't stop uh, there. As uh, you know, we all know, there was this manufactured campaign known as Climate Gate, um, which again, I'm sure it was a coincidence that it happened in the lead up to the Copenhagen summit, which was the first opportunity for meaningful progress in climate change policy in years. Um, thousands of emails between climate scientists, including myself, uh, were um, uh, stolen from a university server in the UK, um, leaked out into the public, and individual words and phrases were cherry-picked uh, from those emails to try to make it sound like scientists were engaged in misconduct, uh, like climate change was indeed the hoax that uh, James Inhofe claimed it to be. And at the time, uh, Sarah Palin wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post um, uh, making uh, all sorts of uh, false allegations about what these emails supposedly showed. Uh, the Washington Post let me publish an op-ed response nine days later um, where I pointed out uh, all of the errors in which she had claimed in her own op-ed. And it does appear to have had an impact even on Sarah Palin herself uh, just a couple years ago. And these are her words. A lot of those emails obviously weren't meant for public consumption and they could be misinterpreted if taken out of context. Those are her own words uh, describing the effort to get a hold of her emails in response to a <laughs> Freedom of Information Act request. So it didn't stop there. James Inhofe um, had a list of not 57, he couldn't come up with 57, but he did come up with 17 climate scientists who should be prosecuted for perpetrating the hoax of climate change as revealed by these emails. I'm proud to say I was a member uh, of one of those 17, as was uh, Susan Solomon. And uh, Gavin uh, was, was on that list, as was Susan Solomon, um, you know, Presidential Medal uh, of Science winner. Well, the next episode, many of you may know, uh, Ken Cuccinelli, the uh, maverick uh, Tea Party Attorney General, newly minted Attorney General in Virginia, um, in his first act as Attorney General, d oh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong Cuccinelli scandal. Um, <laughs> his first act was to try to censor the state seal because it revealed a certain part of the anatomy of the Roman goddess Virtus. His second act as Attorney General was to take a page out of the Joe Barton playbook um, and demand, oh, this was actually by emails with 39 different climate scientists uh, from around the world, um, using uh, a civil investigative demand. It's a civil subpoena that is available to the Attorney General to ferret out state waste and fraud. And since during my time at the University of Virginia, I was working on the science of climate change. It was clearly fraudulent, uh, as revealed by all these emails. Um, he saw this as a legitimate use of a civil investigative demand. Um, others didn't quite see it that way. The Union of Concerned Scientists spoke out immediately, as did uh, American Association of University Professors, ACLU. Even the conservative academic freedom uh, organization, FIRE, came out uh, blasting uh, what they saw as an effort to intimidate scientists, and they didn't see it as a, a partisan political issue. It doesn't matter what your politics are. The idea that if you're doing science that proves inconvenient to certain interests, be they on one side of the political spectrum or the other, that you too could be subject to an inquisition by an activist attorney general, they saw that as a danger. Um, and, you know, 800 scientists from around the state of Virginia, AAAS, NCAR, Ma uh, American Meteorological Society, Nature, all, again, came out when science and scientists were under uh, these politicized attacks to defend science and to call out this sort of intimidation for what it was. Um, even the, conser the conservative Richmond Times dispatch that had endorsed Cuccinelli's uh, candidacy um, blasted him for this uh, attempt to um, intimidate us. And uh, the Washington Post published no less than five editorials blasting Cuccinelli in his witch hunt and even their award-winning uh, cartoonist Tom Tolles couldn't resist commenting on the matter twice. Um, I have to say this is my personal favorite here. It's Cuccinelli with the UVA climate case. And you, I'll be wanting to see your emails too. And that's Galileo down there. So <laughs> yes, I don't mind being compared to Galileo. Five minutes, OK. <laughs> so let, you know, and the bottom line is it was rejected. Oops, I went a little bit past where I meant to go. Um, no, no other direction. 
Um, his subpoena was quashed by the lower court uh, on a technicality. Um, in his 40-page filing to the court, he had forgotten to provide uh, some evidence of wrongdoing on our part. Um, and so it was thrown out by the court. Obviously, he appealed to the state Supreme Court, which uh, just a little over a year ago rejected it with prejudice, meaning that they really don't want to see him ever come back to the court with something like this again. Um, but he's currently leading in some polls to be the next governor of Virginia. Um, so that's a little sobering. Uh, on the other hand, and this is something we've been talking about, there are recent events uh, that might cause us to be a little bit uh, more optimistic about prospect for progress um, in confronting this issue. Uh, you know, the, the extreme weather um, and, and uh, climate events of the past year, and not Sandy in isolation, but I think Sandy in the context of an array of unprecedented weather and climate events over the last year or so, um, has helped to galvanize um, uh, public uh, awareness and support for doing something about climate change. It's changed the discussion. Um, there is a notable change in the way that journalists now frame these extreme weather events where climate change is much more often cite, uh, discussed as, a, as an appropriate context for understanding what's going on. And I do, even though that isn't a direct Sandy signal, I think it's a consequence of Sandy um, along with other events. And so there has been um, a rise in uh, some of the recent public polling in sort of the percentage of the public that recognizes uh, climate change as real and uh, is concerned about it and supports doing something about it. Um, and to me, probably the best indication of the fact that there is, we are making progress, is the heated rhetoric, the violent heated rhetoric that we are now seeing from climate change deniers. Um, it's become uh, far more um, outlandish, far more violent than anything we've seen uh, in the past. And to me, that's the signature of a dying uh, campaign. Um, so I actually take some solace from the fact that I've been, uh, um, it's been suggested by certain uh, uh, bloggers that uh, I might be executed uh, for uh, my role in uh, climate science. Um, now this was actually shown, I think, by, um, uh, uh, let's see, from, uh, who, 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 somebody uh, actually showed a bunch of contrarian uh, media pieces on climate change earlier in this conference. And uh, one of them was this a recent piece by Peter Ferrara, um, a conservative blogger for Forbes, who was trying to compare a climate scientist to uh, Lysenko, who's this infamous uh, Soviet scientist who um, didn't believe in Mendelian uh, genetics and tried to force uh, the entire uh, scientific community to uh, agree to his somewhat Lamarckian uh, views of evolution. And it had some, a negative impact, actually, on Soviet agriculture, um, some have argued. So it's sort of a classic example of what happens when um, when uh, orthodoxy is enforced on the scientific community uh, for political interests. And it was rather ironic that the very same day <laughs> that climate scientists were being accused of being Lysenko's, the chair of the House Science Committee decided that he wanted to do away with peer review at the, for the National Science Foundation, that grants would be funded based on how Congress felt about those <laughs> That was the same day, same day, and a little closer to Lysenko, I would argue, that one. Um, you know, and you know, we still have uh, denial uh, by leading politicians, you know, in Virginia you can't refer to sea level rise in certain government documents. In North Carolina they wanted to, as many of you know, wanted to legislate how sea level rise could actually be uh, projected. Um, but. I see room for progress, and I'm going to wrap it up here, uh, you know, and that we've sort of uh, touched on this a little bit. There are some interesting recent uh, events that suggest that perhaps there are figures within the conservative establishment who are willing to have a science-based uh, discussion about climate change and what to do about it. You have people like David Frum, a former Bush speechwriter, a former writer for National Review, coming out and saying that maybe we should be considering something like a revenue-neutral carbon tax. You even had Grover Norquist for 24 hours uh, come out in support of a carbon tax. Then uh, presumably he got a call from a, a pair of brothers from Kansas who told him he had to <laughs> change his view. All right, well, let me wrap this up um, by, you know, 
so the question is, will we galvanize the support for action on this issue uh, before we commit ourselves to you know, truly dangerous and irreversible changes in the climate. Um, I'm still optimistic that we will. I share some of Richard's, the optimism that Richard um, expressed yesterday. And finally, to me, more than anything else, this is a matter of intergenerational ethics. Um, as Steve Schneider very nicely um, framed it in that video we saw, it's about the sort of world that we're gonna leave behind for our children and grandchildren. It isn't just science, it isn't just economics, it isn't just policy, it's ethics. And it, it, to me, it's intergenerational ethics, you know, what sort of world we leave behind for my daughter and her children and her grandchildren. So thank you very much.